The ocean is the most dangerous environment to train in for the simple fact that everything can go wrong at once. You have to deal with the depths of the water, the currents, the tides, the sea life. It is a very extremely dangerous environment, which is why we train so hard with our students. We can put them safely in the ocean by themselves, day or night, in the worst possible conditions, and they will conduct that mission to perfection. All right guys, we're here at the Special Forces Underwater Operations School. We're gonna be observing the Combat Diver Qualification course. We're really excited to be out here in beautiful Key West, Florida. This course is considered one of the most difficult schools that you can go to, one of the hardest badges to earn in the US military. It taxes you not only physically, not only mentally, there's just no room for letting anybody through but the best because ultimately the ocean doesn't care about your feelings. The ocean doesn't care about whether you are good at something or not good at something. One of the instructors already told us that like, hey, Big Blue don't care. The weather's a little bit shaky this week. I'm sure the guys are gonna be in for a rough go of it. We're not coming at this from the first couple of weeks. I think a lot of people when they're used to seeing uh, the combat diver qualification course, they're used to seeing the drown proofing, the, the, the pool work, guys getting scuffed up right when they first show up here. Uh, that's not the case. We're coming in at the end of the course where everything's coming together, where they start implementing the tactics as well as their knowledge of diving and their knowledge of waterborne operations all into one cohesive package to be effective when they go back to their special forces dive team or their ranger unit or, or wherever they're coming from. This class is, is, is still being a little bit impacted from the pandemic. It's normally a six week course. This one's only five weeks. But the instructors have already told us so far that this is one of their stronger classes, even though that it's a condensed schedule and they're having to do more in less days, but that they're doing overall very well. So we're really excited to go see them. I know we're gonna be up in helicopters. We're gonna be out in the ocean. We're gonna be underwater. We're gonna go see the whole thing. So you're gonna see exactly what a combat diver looks like as they're finishing up this elite course. Although the study of underwater diving techniques is not a required part of the training program at Bad Tolls, 100% of the men here have volunteered to add skin diving to their list of specialties. Combat diving originated from the OSS after World War II. Practice in switching aqua lungs underwater helps to develop a sense of discipline under artificially severe conditions. They saw the need for an underwater infiltration method to get into denied areas, and that blossomed into what we are today. Our schoolhouse was set up in 1964, and since then we have been ever evolving to meet the demands of the current climate that we face in the military. We are the premier unit when it comes to unconventional warfare. And that is what is mainly our focus. The more and more we shift our focus from a landlocked operation to the near pier, the relevancy of combat diving becomes greater and greater. The mission essentially is really to be clandestine subsurface and using the closed circuit rebreather, the LAR-5, doesn't produce any bubbles. So signature as far as subsurface, you won't be able to see them and 
not be able to detect them from afar coming to shore or anywhere else, depending on their targets. We're going to start this point from where it began. You got to have a really good mental game. If you're mentally weak, um, you can be as strong as an ox, fast as a gazelle, but mentally, if you're not just right there, you, you won't be able to pass this course. 80% of passing this course is mental, 20% is physical. This is probably one of, if not the hardest school in the Army. We bring our students down here and we physically train them, probably to the hardest that any of them have ever been in their entire military career. Go! So what is it like to actually execute one? So one, it's, it's very challenging to um, get approval. I mean, a lot of times it's because the safety factors and the risk uh, when it comes to diving is very high, but it's not necessarily high if the safety protocols are, are there. And that's what we're teaching um, our students, but also we're informing our leaders up higher to really let them know like, hey, this is maritime operations and this is what we do. That, that is the biggest challenge that we have, um, is, is getting approval. It actually all starts with pre-mission training. So as soon as a team gets the word that, hey, we have a potential dive mission to conduct, immediately the entire team goes into that, that planning phase. Uh, they'll plan out, they'll look at the tides of the area, the geography, how the, the bottom of the ocean looks, what the tides are doing, and then they'll start training for that on, on what's called a dive requalification. All in all, from start to finish, from that order being given to the conducting of that mission can be six to eight months worth of train up just to conduct that mission. It's very important for that train up because this is truly the one time where a commander does not have any control or communication with his team while they're subsurface. You give it a little tug, you're gonna take this side, plug it in, give it a little tug, and then again, you're gonna crack it on and ensure that nothing is leaking or that none of the hoses pop out. This is the only thing between you and your boat sinking, all right? Right now what we have going on is we're constructing our combat rubber rating craft. The versions that we have here are the wing boats. And so the configuration that we're going to be constructing them in is going to be roll duct configuration. So that way we're able to push these out of a UH-60 helicopter. We're going to jump in after it and then we're going to unfold these and inflate them utilizing our single 80 tanks. Right now, we're constructing them and we're going to check them to ensure that we don't have any failed inflations out on the water because that could be the most detrimental part to our mission in the maritime environment. Check it out. Scheme of maneuver for today, all right, is going to be slick, combat equipment, rolled duck. Everybody good with that? So our first iteration or our first lift is obviously going to be slick. I'm going to get all of the CDQC guys out of the bird first. So that's going to be nine total personnel and one UH-60, nine in the other. It's gonna be tight, all right? But that's the way we have to do it so that way we can actually hit the time that we need on the timeline and get done before this weather comes in. All right, so we're out here uh, about 25 miles off of Key West. We're watching the CDQC students. They're coming in from the island on Black Hawk helicopters. They're gonna helo cast into the ocean in, in the wing boats. They're at the point in the course now where everything's starting to come together. They're confident in the water. They're uh, bringing what they've learned about operating the ocean together with tactics.
I crack them. So the combat and dive community is extremely small. Special Forces is maybe less than 1% of the actual Army and combat diving in the Army is maybe a fraction of 1% of those numbers. We have an extremely small community and everyone is truly a brother to each other. We have guys who come back here after being retired for 20 years and they can still see their plaques on the wall and remember their time here at dive school. The camaraderie of being a combat diver doesn't stop when you retire. You know, your, your chest sticks out a little bit once you get that bubble and you know you're part of an extremely special community. We are out here at the uh... Sergeant Major Jerry D. Patton water drop zone at the Special Forces Underwater Operations School. We're getting into the thick of some of the more heavier tactics here. The students right now are traveling about 1.5 kilometers, about 1,500 meters off of the, the shoreline here. And they're gonna drop in, go subsurface, infill into about 250 meters or so. They're gonna pop up, check out the, the, the beach line here. And then from there, they're gonna send two swimmers forward to secure the beachhead, establish comms, and then uh, signal for the thumbs up for the rest of them to come on and, uh, and take the beach here. So, should be a pretty cool little uh, exercise here. We're gonna be positioned right here uh, with them to see them come up over the beach and, and take the beach. So, really excited to see what these guys pull off. All right, gentlemen, let's go. One at a time, okay? All right, so we're out here at Smith Shoal, getting ready to do the final uh, field training exercise before uh, these brand new combat divers get their uh, dive badges, their dive bubbles, and uh, go back out to their units to do great things. Pretty much what they're planning on doing to, uh, to make this all happen is there's a notional exercise here where they're gonna go into the AFRICOM area of operations and blow up some boats. They're gonna board it. Twin MH-47 helicopters with, with their boats, push those out into the ocean, and then they'll take those over to a, uh, a point where then they'll jock up with dive gear, go in and clandestinely place uh, explosives on, I believe it's two to three boats, and, uh, and then get back out of there without anybody knowing that they were there. It's really bringing everything that they've learned in this course so far to a head, uh, where they've gotta make everything work, use all of the knowledge that they learned, and uh, pull off a successful operation. I think one of the things that is unique about what they do here is once they, they built their own plan to execute this target, and then they brief that plan to the special forces group, the active duty special forces group that's responsible for the Africa area of operations, and had those commanders punch holes in it and make sure that this would actually be a suitable plan to go execute in a real world operation. You don't really see that in any other training pipeline. Uh, or any other training course um, that students are going through. So these guys are gonna be walking out of here, standing pretty tall, knowing that they're ready to go out and execute operations with their dive teams around the world. I'm excited to see how it all goes down.
very typical on what they would do. Sabotage is something that we're trying to teach and get out there in the force. Now that Merop operations is growing exponentially in our AOs, uh, specifically in the Africa set, the Southcom, uh, uh, South America subset for Seven Group and Southeast Asia. So this is a this is something that typically you could see. It's been a while since we've done it, um, but we're trying to teach our students that, and hopefully they can take that lessons uh, that they learn here back to their teams on operational uh, groups. At the end of the day, typical. Alphas in SF, they strive to be the best and normally the dive teams are the first ones uh, trusted to go into any conflict and you can go as far as Desert Storm where a lot of the dive teams were the first teams on the ground even though we never did any type of diving and I think leaders look at dive teams to where they're physically fit, two, they're hungry very aggressive, not taking away from any other ODA that's out there. But at the end of the day, you can count on 12 guys to go and conduct a mission, whether it be water or land, and they'll do the right thing.